very happy to welcome all of you here on a very exciting and happy occasion. We are here to honor two very great teachers. J. Irvin Swigert on your right here, and Thomas W. Parmley on your left. J. Thomas J. Parmley. <laughs> He keeps teaching, doesn't he? <laughs> and we're very pleased to have uh, distinguished guests here, uh, some of whom will participate in the ceremonies today. We welcome President Gardner, Dr. Peterson of the State Science Office, David Grant, Dean of the College of Science, and Elder Neil Maxwell of the Quorum of the Twelve of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. If, if we were really doing this properly, we wouldn't have this clear area here, but we would have tables loaded with equipment and monkeys that fall and guns that shoot and little sailboats that sail. And above all, there would be surprises uh, the dignity of this occasion probably doesn't allow us to do this uh, in a way that would really fit the spirit of these two men. Uh, but I think we all recognize that as, as teachers who have long been revered and respected, that, that they've made a real difference to a lot of people. I did a quick and dirty calculation last night which was meaningless, but I'll tell you the results anyway. Uh, the calculation was this. I took the number of people that they have taught and made the simple assumption that each one of those students taught that many more people. And what you find out is that in that one step, you would have taught the whole world. <laughs> we would now like to uh, turn this podium to President David Pierpont Gardner for remarks, and then we would like to hear from Dr. Richard Peterson, Science Specialist of the Science Office of the State Board. I didn't hear either uh, Professor Parmley or Professor Swigert um, find fault with your conclusions. <laughs> That uh, must be explained by their general uh, uh, reticent character. Well, it's a pleasure to be uh, included on this program today, uh, but particularly to be able to join uh, here with the uh, colleagues, families, and friends of those we are honoring. And I appreciate that very much indeed, and hope that I might add, uh, might add uh, uh, usefully, although briefly, to this special occasion. Uh, this is a splendid day for the University of Utah. Uh, we don't often do these things. Uh, the naming of both buildings, uh, rooms, and facilities on this campus occurs only infrequently. And thus it is uh, both appropriate and uh, fitting that we should be gathered here today on an uncommon occasion honor two of the university's truly uh, distinguished master teachers. In naming these two lecture halls after uh, Professor Parmley and Professor Swigert, the Department of Physics, the College of Science, and the University of Utah honors two consummate educators, two men who have devoted their skills, their energy, their talent, their knowledge, their means, their time, to their students, to scholarship, and to a wide range of both public and professional service. I could have surely benefited from studying under either one. As I review their record, they were able to teach students physics. I was never so fortunate as to be able to learn it very well. Students must have had their minds dazzled and their senses delighted in their classes. 
learning classic principles of physics, and more particularly in advanced courses in pre-med physics and in engineering physics along the way. Professor Parmley first taught at the university as an instructor from 1921 to 1924. I should wish to say he might very well have taught my mother who studied here at that time. But his permanent appointment as a regular member of this faculty occurred in 1927, and he was teaching as a regular member of this faculty, even though in emeritus status, until very recently. Professor Swigert's appointment was made as a regular member of this faculty in 1931, and his teaching during the intervening years has been interrupted, uninterrupted until just recently. Now, these two men are not only colleagues, but their careers have tended to be remarkably parallel. Although <clears throat> Professor Parmley is a nuclear physicist and Professor Swigert is an engineering physicist, it is hard to distinguish the two in terms of skill and dedication. Take, for example, the following information. Both have taught tens of thousands of students. Now, if you think that's easy, try teaching just 10 at any given time <laughs> and doing it well. Both have found their greatest personal joy in teaching, the most elevated of professions. Both have earned their students' respect and affection. Both share an enviable record in years of service, as I have mentioned. Together, they've amassed over 100 years of teaching at the University of Utah. <clears throat> Both have been honored with distinguished teaching awards given by the University of Utah, Professor Swigert in 1979, Professor Parmley in 1970. Both have received distinguished service citations from the American Association of Physics Teachers, Professor Swigert in 1970, and Professor Parmley's <clears throat> will be awarded uh, next month. Both have served as consultants to major corporations, not only in this state but nationally, and as major consultants to uh, some of the nation's major research laboratories. Both have been an invaluable resource drawn upon by the university for all of its purposes, not just in physics and in science, for over a half a century. Both are emeriti, professors of physics, and they are virtuoso teachers. I regret very much not having had the pleasure and privilege of studying under either one. But I have many friends who have, and their stories are a source both of inspiration and hilarity. <clears throat> it is thus fitting that the University of Utah honors these two professors in the naming of these splendid lecture halls after them, just as the university is privileged to be able to attach the names of these two splendid teachers and distinguished professors and persons of uh, almost unparalleled service to the University of Utah to these two halls. I congratulate both of them in behalf of the university and appreciate very much indeed the opportunity of participating on this very special occasion. Thank you. I'm delighted and honored this afternoon to participate with you in this dedication ceremony and to honor two great teachers whose work at this university is legion and whose influence in the lives of their students will go on for generations. Both have earned, if only it were given, a Nobel Prize in physics teaching. I believe I'm here today not to speak for Dick Peterson, but for hundreds or even thousands who have over the years been taught and influenced by these two men. This community, our state, our nation, and the world have been lifted just a little higher because Dr. Parmley and Dr. Swigert cared and they performed their work with love and devotion. 
It would be deceptive of me to lead you to believe that I know Dr. Swigert well. I do not. I knew him by reputation and vicariously as former students of mine would tell me how much they appreciated him as a person and respected him as a teacher. So while most of my remaining comments are centered around Dr. Parmley's accomplishments and professional contributions, I would like to think that without too much transposition, they would apply to Dr. Swigert as well. I'm going to share with you now comments from a few individuals whose lives have been touched by Dr. Parmley. A Utah school superintendent, quote, he is the greatest teacher I have ever had in my entire educational career. In my opinion, he has done more to, prove instru to improve instruction in physics in the state of Utah than any other single individual." Close quote. A professor of physics at the University of Colorado at Boulder, quote, here is a man who has had 60 years as a teacher of physics, which is roughly half the life of the university. Here is a man who I suspect is not widely known in the national community of physicists, but who had probably had more constructive influence on physics teaching than most of us. Here is a man who still gives physics demonstrations for high school students and the public. Here is a man who is a master teacher, if there ever was one." Close quote. A former provost at this university, quote, he not only successfully supervised the academic work of hundreds of secondary school science teachers, but was a source of genuine inspiration to them and their families. Only those who observed firsthand Professor Parmley's work with those teachers could fully appreciate the remarkable impact he had upon them. I am very sure that no person in the history of the university has had a more impressive teaching career than Professor Parmley. I refer not simply to the great length of his service as a teacher, but to his exceptional effectiveness in teaching physics." Close quote. From a Deseret News editorial, June 3, 1978, quote, as Dr. Parmley has so sec successfully demonstrated, age and youth need not be adversaries. They need more to be collaborators. The old have so much they can teach the young, close quote. And I might add, to teach them in such a way that they can hardly wait for tomorrow's class. From a secondary school science teacher, quote, no one has earned the retirement opportunity any more than Dr. Parmley, but somehow I had the secret hope that he could go on forever. And he will in our hearts, in our thoughts, and in our lives." Close quote. Just a couple of comments from a personal viewpoint now. It was in the 1957-58 school year that the first academic year institute was held here at the University of Utah. I think it was the second in the nation. Dr. Parmley headed that institute, and I was privileged to attend. What a great opportunity. I was a young science teacher at that time, and I think my horizons were beginning to close just a little bit. And then I had that experience. They opened up, and as I went back, 24 hours was nowhere near enough time to do all the things that I wanted to do. I think he could see that many of us were in the process of becoming that is, becoming better science teachers, but that the ripening process was hastened by him, none of us would deny. And I see here today Millie Trevithick, and Millie was a great asset to that program and has been a great asset to Dr. Parmley over the years, and I'd just like to recognize her also for the outstanding work that she did in helping us and Dr. Parmley. Also, in the intervening years, he's been willing to collaborate with the activities of the Utah Science Teachers Association. Sometimes we find those that feel, my contribution is at the university level. I belong to the American Association of Physics Teachers, or whatever it may be, and let the secondary and the elementary people kind of get along the best they can. Dr. Parmley wasn't one who believed that for a moment. Whenever he found an opportunity to step in, 
and to assist in any way, he did so. He has been honored, as many of you know, by that group with their, the highest award that they can present, which is the Science Educator Award. He received the first one granted by that group. He's worked with us for the last 15 years in the Utah State Science Talent Search. This is for senior students in the public schools whose work has been judged outstanding. And then we call them in for a personal interview to let them report the things that they have been doing. Professor Parmley sits as a member of that panel. Not a one goes out of there that doesn't uh, sometime later say, I surely appreciated that kindly gentleman and the way in which he helped me clarify the concepts that I was a little bit fuzzy on. So we appreciate him much for that. But I think most importantly, the model that he has set for successful teaching and living is by far the greatest legacy that he has left to us. As I think about both Dr. Parmley and Dr. Swigert and their life's work, these words from Lowell echo through my mind, and I'm quoting, the only conclusive evidence of a man's sincerity is that he gives himself for a principle. Words, money, all things else are comparatively easy to give away. But when a man makes a gift of his daily life and practice, it is plain that in that truth he is sincere." Close quote. This dedication ceremony here today is most fitting and appropriate in that both of these men have made a gift of their daily life and practice. Now if the things that transpire in these lecture halls from this time forth will but reflect a measure of the greatness, the humility, and the integrity of these two teachers after whom they are being named, all mankind will be the beneficiaries. Thank you. We'd now like to begin the part of this program in which these rooms are named. The first guest who will name one of these rooms is Dr. David M. Grant, Dean of the College of Science, who will name room 101 for J. Irvin Swigert. Dr. Grant was a student of uh, Dr. Swigert uh, a little while ago. <laughs> with all the fun which uh, we've had with uh, Haven's cartoons, anything I say now is going to be an anticlimactic. Uh, I'm glad you changed the tape. I, I understand the professors, when they begin, they very seldom can quit shy of 50 minutes. And <laughs> <coughs> but I prepared a few remarks uh, so that I wouldn't abuse you in such a way. I think we all know that in the normal course of events that there are things that we, we do out of a sense of duty. There are other things that are pleasant tasks, and then there are those few golden occasions, such as today, where we have the privilege of participating and doing those things which are of great deep personal satisfaction, and that's the case for myself today. Today's events certainly fall in that category, as I've had an occasion uh, to be associated with these two great teachers for essentially the total of my professional life. I'm personally delighted to be a part of the proceedings to honor and to lend my commendations to Irvin Swigert and Tom Parmley. Some years ago, we shared a common building. I can never remember of a single occasion in which uh, we had a disagreement that was not handled in a gentlemanly and appropriate way. Dr. Parmley at that time was serving as the chairman of the physics department, was invaluable to me in helping me to learn my duties as a newly appointed chairman in chemistry. Now my, my assignment today is to give proper honor to Professor Swigert. He occupies a very special and affectionate part in my own professional life, as he is the one who taught me college physics. Professor uh, Swigert has already found true recognition and prominence 
in the minds and the esteem of his students. And uh, I think I gained a further appreciation for that recently. We have a visitor from China here who constantly is telling me of his feelings towards his former teachers. I think echoes the feelings that maybe we have even in our society that maybe do not express uh, sufficiently often or at appropriate occasions. Now, while it is both fitting and appropriate that we symbolize this recognition and this honor with mortar and bronze, it is the deep affection and high regard of literally tens of thousands of Irvin's former students, which is the significant reality of today's ceremonies. In many respects, it is the university and those who set in motion these proceedings who have distinguished themselves here today by showing that they know how to recognize true greatness. How fitting it is that the very chambers of this modern cathedral of science should bear the names of those who, in the mo who are the moving spirits of this structure. I believe this action establishes a touching precedent worthy of future imitation across campus. Now, President uh, Gardner has ably given you a brief biography of these two great individuals. John Irvin Schweiger was born January 31, 1904 at Metcalf, Illinois. He joined the University of Utah faculty in 1931 after receiving his bachelor's degree in 1929 at Illinois Wesleyan University and his master's in 1930 at the University of Indiana. He completed the PhD also at the University of Indiana later in 1938 while serving as an instructor here at the Un University of Utah. Working through the various ranks of assistant, associate, and full professor, Professor Swigert has established an enviable reputation amongst the students of this great institution. Uh, just before this, this session be began, uh, Dr. Baker from Utah State University came up to emphasize that it was Professor Swiger, Professor Linford, uh, Professor Hayward, who, who uh, just shortly after the Second World War established a program in upper air research. And he played a key role in the establishment of this, this program, which is now located at Utah State University. A year or so ago, I was at Yale University at a dedication of an instrumentation facility and noted on a dedication plaque that that building at Yale University was dedicated in 1931. The reason I remember the date is that happens to be the date of my birth, Irvin. And uh, so I arrived uh, in Salt Lake the same time you did. <laughs> But uh, I want Irvin to know that he's in much better condition than the building at Yale. <laughs> so a few personal reflections. Uh, if I tried to pick the single word that typified Professor Swigert, I think it would be enthusiasm. You'd get so turned on in physics after an hour there that the rest of the campus this was the main course of the day. The rest of the offerings were sort of hors d'oeuvres and maybe a few uh, finger sandwiches. Uh, and I think that Irvin kind of saw it that way. In the, in the book, The Last Days of Pompeii, we read that enthusiasm is a genius of sincerity and truth accomplishes no victories without it. And that was the way I'd typify his lecture. Every one of them was a victory. I remember on one occasion, one young man had a reason for uh, of changing the exam in physics from the day that had been announced. Uh, and uh, the shock on uh, Professor Swigert's face that one would ever change an exam in physics for something as trivial as something going on elsewhere on campus. <laughs> And uh, so no one ever uh, approached such an issue in future sessions. I can't always say that Irvin was, was as uh, genteel with her colleagues elsewhere on campus, because I think he really did believe that this was the center here in the physics department 
the center of the university, President Gardner. Uh, but enthusiasm was the thing, he's a master salesman of his art, was the thing that transmitted to his students. Number two, his demonstrations uh, were renowned. They constantly reminded us that science has its roots in the world about us and not in the shadows of abstraction. Now, every demonstration at the beginning of the lecture uh, was followed by derivations. He, he never left us without the mathematical sword and shield with which to do battle after we got the concept. Without moralizing in piety, he did teach integrity and respect for principles of hard work and comradery and intellectual honesty. His, his sessions were more than just a technical dissertation. They were sessions where he emphasized that uh, people played a role in science and that they had to assume the responsibilities that went with it. And thus, Irvin taught not only physics, but students. Preoccupation with scientific principles never robbed him of concern for the participants in science. The person was every bit as important as the discipline. Now, uh, I'm sure these two individuals, my time is coming to an end, uh, would not be satisfied if I talked only about them. So I have a little anecdotal story I'd like to share. Back in uh, the mid-20s of the 1600s in Stockholm, the Swedish Admiralty had got together and decided to build the world's biggest ship. Uh, I don't know when it started, but it was finished in 1628. Now, I suspect into that discussion of building the world's biggest ship had gone hours of policy decision, probably reaching to the top of the government of, the, of Sweden. And those who are historians know that Sweden was a bit of a pain to most of their neighbors in those days. They'd take their big ships and go and rob the rest of the countries of all their cultural artifacts and so forth. But finally, this world's largest ship had been finished in 1628. Four stories high, it had a royal quarter, very lavishly fitted, the finest timbers and selected woods, great amounts of brass and other precious metals, and as I recall, about 32 cannons surrounded the deck. Launch day finally arrived. I suspect it was a festive occasion in Stockholm. The whole city turned out, I suspect. Great excitement, national pride at its all-time highest. Then came the launch. The ship sl slid into the water, sho shuddered briefly, and then turn o turned over and sank. Uh, 300 years later, it was brought to the surface. You can see it now in a, in a specially constructed structure in Stockholm, in proper humidity so that the wood will not crack. It's very spongy and they're, they're injecting polymers to uh, restore the ship. Nautical experts have found the reason the thing fell over is the center of gravity is too high. Uh, Instead of having 400 tons of ballast, they only had put 150 tons of uh, rock into the bottom of the ship. Now you see, every one of Professor Swigert's students, at least those who passed the course, <laughs> could have predicted how much, how much rock to get in the ship to get the center of gravity below the surface of the water so that the thing would be stable. Uh, I think there's a great message here. How many hours how much concern went into all that national policy decision and no one was worrying about the rock. And the foundation and the material and the support that was needed to make that ship flow. I think that uh, there is a moral to this story. We need more people that understand basic physical laws of nature. A national policy without scientific and technical excellence will ultimately end in the same kind of disaster. And Irvin Schweiger, to me, is the epitome of that type of a person to share that kind of technical ability and understanding that we might proceed to meet the challenges with which we are faced 
not only for the technical scientist and the uh, specialist, but for the generalist, those in society who want to know more about where we, where we really are in terms of meeting the challenges. Now my final tribute to Irvin. He truly enjoyed the educational process and once more proved what thinking men have known for centuries, that no greater fulfillment can be found than to aspire to the high position of teaching youth and to carry it out with dedication and excellence. Irvin, would you stand? And I don't know how to name buildings. Uh, they, break <laughs> they break champagne bottles on ships. <laughs> But uh, my good friend Elder Maxwell is with us, so we'll have to spare him that. <laughs> <coughs> but I think it would be appropriate, uh, I suspect, President, that I have the authority to name this room 101 the J. Irvin Swigert Lecture Hall of Physics. Would you all join me in a standing ovation to <laughs> Professor Swigert? people who have participated in arranging this program and deciding to do this thing because I consider it a very, very great honor. And I want to thank everyone who had anything to do with it. The secretaries in our department have worked just as hard, I think, as the professors to make this a successful program today. I love to teach students. And to receive an honor like this for doing something which is the thing you would rather have done than anything else in the world is really a great tribute. And so I appreciate that very much. I taught engineering physics. It was somewhat technical. But my own philosophy of physics is not only that it is a quantitative experimental science, but it is also a logical, speculative philosophy. And the two must go together. And I try to get my students to think along those lines. And students were my main project rather than physics. But I like to work with the students and get them to see this way of thinking in physics that we use. I believe that all education is simply the self-activity of the learner. But to get that activity, the part that the teacher plays in it, is the thing that I try to do in physics. I try to do demonstrations, and then the analysis of those demonstrations things that would allow the student to think for himself and go on even beyond anything that had been done in that class pertaining to that subject. I wanted the student to learn that we think that physics is a way of thinking about the space-time distribution of matter and energy in the universe. And it's to that purpose that I devoted my attention most in the department. I thank you all very, very much for being here. People have come here to this from coast to coast, and I appreciate that. Uh, and also, some of my own students who live here locally are here. I appreciate it all very much. Thank you. I'd now like to turn this lectern to Elder Neil A. Maxwell, who will name room 103. It's a genuine privilege to be with you today, ladies and gentlemen, to honor these two master teachers. 
It is perhaps of more than passing significance that the electron was discovered in 1897, the year of Thomas J. Parmley's birth. And like those electrons, Tom has been on the move ever since. <laughs> Think of how many times the world has turned over, literally, since Tom Parmley was a freshman at the University of Utah in 1915. As a physicist, Tom Parmley understands much more than most of us about the makeup of the physical world in the universe. As a man of faith, he accepts what Isaiah said about why this earth was created. It was formed to be inhabited. Hence, when you and I do what we can to keep this planet habitable, we are truly about our Father's business. While Tom has worked with highly classified material, Tom's love of his students has been no secret. As is true of any great teacher, Tom has not only taught physics, he has taught what he is, as his love of science has combined with his love of students. Though Tom has lived in a time of turbulent technological change and of increasing complexity, Tom's relationships with others have continued to feature a marvelous simplicity. His students are scattered all over this planet, and Tom has cared for them and served them not only in the classroom and the laboratory, but also in his personal relationships with them. He has been their friend and collaborator as well as their mentor. In the relationships between the generations, Tom has been himself unabashedly. True to his nature, he has been generous in his regard for others rather than critical. He has assumed his students would do likewise, much in the spirit of what another mentor wrote centuries ago. Give thanks unto God that he hath made manifest unto you our imperfections, that ye may learn to be more wise than we have been. Tom has cared enough about truth to really prepare himself to impart it with accuracy as well as enthusiasm. If at times Tom has been theatrical in his teaching in order to make a point, it is because he has never lost his genuine love and excitement about the universe and its marvels. Tom is never bored. He would have no difficulty appreciating these lines from G.K. Chesterton, the brilliant Catholic writer, who wrote, It may just be that God says to the sun to rise every morning and to the moon to shine again each night because there is divine delight in seeming repetition and that God has never grown tired of making all daisies alike because God has never grown tired of daisies. And you and I honor a man today who has never grown tired of students, Tom Parmley. The honors of the world and the praise of men have not diverted Tom Parmley from his personal sweetness and from his fundamental faith. Tom, in his humility, can acquiesce in the notion that human science is but the backward discovery of the interweavings in God's tapestry of truth. Thus, the numerous awards for being a distinguished teacher or professor are but reminders of his commitment to the truth, but more than that, of his commitment to people. It shouldn't surprise us much, therefore, that Tom, who has studied much about radioactivity, would himself be such a radiating teacher, and that his excitement over science should have proved so contagious. Nor, to comment even more personally, can we forget that Tom Parmley was blessed to be cured of cancer. His extra years, thus given, could be measured in many ways, one of which would be that the extension of Tom Parmley's years made possible the academic year institutes, in which hundreds of high school science teachers enrolled and in turn bettered thousands of science students. Neither would this occasion be complete without noting how Tom's life had another very full dimension because of his marriage to Laverne, an outstanding woman whose leadership was to touch thousands upon thousands of children. Tom and Laverne blended their careers so elegantly. When I think of Tom, I think of the lines uttered about the Duke of Wellington when, on the occasion of his victory at Waterloo, he fell exhausted and said of himself in a brief moment of immodesty, I do not think it would have done for me not to have been here. Tom Parmley, <laughs> Tom Parmley, it would not have done for you not to have been here. Would you please rise? Drawing upon the authority of the Institutional Council of the University of Utah, it is now my pleasure to name the lecture hall adjoining this one in honor of Dr. Thomas J. Parmley. 
Henceforth, that adjoining hall will be imprinted with Tom's name. Much more importantly, however, Thomas Parmalee happily has already left his imprint upon the hearts and minds of thousands of students. Congratulations, Tom, and God bless you. As I see these microphones in front of me, I almost feel like the president might be speaking. Uh, as Haven was giving his uh, lecture over there, I thought, my, that's better than what anyone I've ever given. Uh, I've I could have learned so much from that. Well, this is an occasion which one's emotions are running very high, I can assure you. Um, many thoughts have run through my mind while sitting here. I didn't prepare any kind of a speech at all. I just thought I'd see what would develop. But I'll never forget the, uh, shortly after I entered the university in, in, as a professor, uh, in the afternoon I was teaching a class along about, I guess about two o'clock. And here I was working and slaving, getting ready, you know. When you're a new professor, believe me, you spend many hours worrying before you ever give your lecture. And I was in that mood and just at that moment in walked President George Thomas into my office. And we chatted a while. I was very nervous. And then I said, well, President Thomas, uh, will you forgive me? I've got to go to my class. He said, that's the reason I'm here. My heart sank to the bottom of my shoes or further. I don't know. And I, the only consolation I have is that I, he didn't fire me. <laughs> I'm still here. Then I started, my mind started to turn to uh, experiences I've had. Let me just maybe relate one or two. Uh, I remember a class in the springtime of giving a final examination. Of course, you know the te how the tension is in the class. And uh, as I walked around and saw the students in action, I saw a young man, uh, he was very much concerned. He seemed to be upset and so on. So I went over and put my arm around him. I said, well, what's the problem? He said, well, when I get through, I'm running downtown to get married. <laughs> I said, well, look, young man, let me see your paper. So I, took, I just took up his paper and looked at it. I said, you know something? You've got an A. <laughs> now, <laughs> now go on down to the, <clears throat> and get married. Well, those are, uh, that's just one of a million of those things that happen in your lifetime. Uh, oh, maybe should I tell you this one? I had a young lady come into my office one uh, time, uh, one of my students, and she, and she had some problems about religion. And so I spent several hours with her, and uh, I think her point of view changed considerably after those closed sessions. Well, uh, my wife and I came to one of the travel series on campus, and I was sitting on the aisle and down near the front. And in the break that took place, this young lady came down, unbeknownst to me, came right down, put her arms around me, gave me a kiss, and walked backward, back to her seat. You can wonder, I had to make a lot of explanations to my <laughs> wife. <laughs> then I was just thinking of uh, one time we were in New York City. As I got to the um, Times Square, I was crossing a bit, very busy intersection, and right there out in a very small section, I met at least half a dozen of my students. Uh, we really had a good time. <laughs> and then I guess for maybe just the last, uh, we traveled a lot, of course, together. And uh, in our trip around the world, here I met one of my students in Rome. And what a wonderful experience we had to see everything in Rome because of this young, young, wonderful young lady was so kind. Well, all I can say to you, I'm so, I wish somehow all the thousands of students that I've had could somehow get together and I could just say thank you for the privilege of being with you. <coughs> I've learned a lot from them. And through you, I thank you for being here very much. I hope you'll carry the message back to your friends. And thank you, President Gardner and Neil and all the rest of you and the dean for what you've done. 
Thank you very much.